They're called the greatest generation, men and women from all walks of life, who grew up in the Great Depression, led our nation to victory in World War II, and helped make America a beacon of freedom and democracy for all the world. And do they have some stories to tell? I'm pleased to be partnering with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center to preserve the words and memories of many of our World War II veterans. These stories will be entered into the state's archives, where they will be accessible to researchers, academics, and future generations. Our veterans have given so much to help build a brighter future for all Americans. This tribute is just one small way of saying thank you. When I was 21, I was drafted into the United States Army. And what, what, what branch did you serve in? Well, when I was drafted, I was just a draftee like mm -hmm. everybody else. And, uh, we left, uh, uh, I think, on all, in the month of August from Watertown, New York, here of 1942, mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of other people from the Watertown to Fort Niagara. We took our basic training. And, Strangely enough, because I had been a quality control technician, I was assigned to the Chemical Warfare Service. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and as time went on, I, while I was taking my basic training in Chemical Warfare Service, I found out that there was an organization called OCS, Officers Candidate School. And uh, I looked into that a little bit and talked to a few sergeants and thought, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good deal. You get to be a second lieutenant and saves you a lot of walking and a lot of other stuff. So I applied for officer candidate school and was accepted. Uh, the only hang up being that because I was physically A1, uh, I had to choose between infantry, artillery, and uh, armor uh, as an officer. So the, at that time, the 4th Armor Division was stationed at Fort Drum. Mm -hmm. or Camp Pine in those days and uh, one of the things that before I entered the Army at age 21 when I entered the Army in August uh, my wife Mary and I had just been married in July mm -hmm. so I thought to myself well if I get to be in armor maybe I'll get to go to Fort Drum and uh, my wife was here at the time up in Lewis County. So you were thinking <laughs> thinking of her. But it never happened anyway I went to Fort Knox I uh, went through OCS, got to be a second lieutenant in the armored uh, forces, and uh, quite an accomplishment for a young kid. Uh, before that time, the biggest gun he'd ever seen in his life was his dad's 12-gauge shotgun. And, uh, and I was assigned to uh, an, what they called at that time a separate tank battalion. Mm -hmm seven numbered down, in this case the 785th Tank Battalion. And at that time the 785th Tank Battalion was assigned to what they called the Armored School in Fort Knox, Kentucky. So we were there in this so-called school duty, uh, training with other people and with, uh, until, uh, see, 1942, 40, about, about 1940, end of 1943. First part of 1944, we were sent to uh, Camp Carson, Colorado, to mm -hmm. train with the 104th Division, and, uh, and we eventually were sent back to Fort Knox. At which time we were sent overseas to the Pacific Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened when you got over to the Pacific Theater? What was you know? What well, we were we were tank units in the Pacific Theater. We're not typically tank unit as most people understand tank warfare in Africa and so, so, places. So how was it different then? Well, it was different because first of all the Japanese had very little heavy armor equipment mm -hmm. that could damage them. And second of all, there was no tank maneuvering type warfare. Mm -hmm. Our mission really was to support infantry. The infantry would be uh, 77th Division, which we were assigned to, would be uh, going down Luzon in this case. We, we landed in the Ngayan Gulf and started down the island towards Manila. And whenever the infantry would get pinned down or 
something would happen where they needed heavy armor. You'd be there. They'd, to get on the, they'd get on the horn and call us up, and we'd go forward and and, and shoot at whatever they pointed out to us to shoot at. And, uh, you were kind of like the ace in the hole, so to speak. Yeah. Well, it was it was very similar to uh, what nowadays uh, they use helicopters and mm -hmm. things like that for that kind of mission. That purpose. Yeah. 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 Now they it was tanks in this mm -hmm. case, and we went down through. Luzon until we got to Manila and they liberated Manila. And we were loaded onto a uh, LST to go to Okinawa, and just about halfway to Okinawa, uh, the war ended, you know, because of uh, Harry Truman's decision to drop the atomic bomb. What were your thoughts on that? Well, we were all very happy about it because we had been told by our uh, plans and training officer that when we were gearing up for this invasion, that we could plan on at least 80 percent casualties. Oh, wow. Going into the, so we, we weren't very, we were not unhappy about not having to do that. <laughs> so now, now you, you said you found out the news that the war had ended halfway to Okinawa. Yeah. Did you turn around and go yeah. back or did you, oh, okay, you no, did. No, LST turned around and went back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we were there just outside of Manila for a while, and, mm -hmm. and I don't know how this happened, but anyway, the Half West Pac headquarters uh, requested a company from our battalion to set up a prisoner of war camp down in the South Harbor of Manila to uh, receive incoming Japanese prisoners of war from mm -hmm. the other island. And by that time, I was a captain and the company commander of C Company. And my battalion commander called me up and said, you're it. You take your company, you go down there and do what you need to do to do what they tell you to do. Mm -hmm. So we went down there and we actually set up a prisoner of war enclosure in South Harbor, Manila, using the tanks as pillboxes on the corner and wow. concentrating wire. And, and we, we requested uh, tents and all the paraphernalia you need to do that with. And How many POWs did you have? Well, we ended up Japanese with about 2,000. We started out with 700 and something. Wow. Uh, but the, uh, and these were tankers, these guys. You know, we were, we were completely ignorant of how to, how to conduct a prisoner of war camp. But to make a long story short on that, the first, the first load of prisoners of war we got came into the dock on the area that we were had set up this prisoner war camp in, and they dropped the gate and, and the tank deck, which was quite a space, was just full of Japanese mm -hmm. prisoners of war in all states of condition of starvation and wounded and mm -hmm. everything else. So now you have to understand too that most of my enlisted men in the company I was in were kids from Texas along the border and they were less familiar with that than I was. Well, anyway, to make a long story short on that, when we unloaded this first load of prisoners, we said, throw your weapons off in the ground as you come down the ramp. And we got that message, but it was a really a, a real can of worms because none of us spoke Japanese. Yeah, how did that, what, well, what did you do? I have to tell you, uh, this, this is what's really uh, strange about this story. Is that while I'm trying to get these guys to line up so we can count them, and, and my non-coms are going crazy, not knowing what to do, I hear this person back in the crowd giving commands in Japanese, lining them up. So I said to my first sergeant, go find out who that is and bring him to me turned out to be a Japanese officer who was a graduate of Purdue U University. Wow. Well, better English than I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said to him, you stay right here by me. Don't you move an inch. <laughs> and you, t you tell these guys what I want. <laughs> that saves the day. Really. I, it sort of sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, we were in this prisoner war camp for I did as company commander for eight months. Wow. And, uh, 
and then uh, my number came up to come back to the States mm -hmm. in uh, 40, 45. So what happened to the camp when you, when well, you came back home? Did they, did they keep the camp they running? Kept, or? Well, they kept the camp running. I, actually, the camp was a sort of the base camp for holding war crimes prisoners you know, up in Bilibid Prison in Manila, they were holding the Japanese war crimes, and that's the place where Gen General Yamashita, who was the Japanese general in charge of the uh, death march out of Bataan, he was being tried there as a war criminal and eventually hung mm -hmm. in that place. Uh, the the uh, Pacific method of handling war prisoners was, was a little bit quicker and more positive in the European method. This man was tried, found to be a, a war criminal by a, a board of officers and hung. A man from Texas, a sergeant who knew how to make a gallows, built one out and they, they hung him. And we had, at one time in this prisoner war camp, we had six Japanese general officers. But anyway, I, I came home and went back about my business working in the paper mill. It was a, I guess you might say, a, a quite an experience, really. Because of I would say I so, yeah. Yeah, it was a, in the experience of, of, of combat on Luzon, coupled with this prisoner of war thing, was, was quite an experience for a kid who, who had no military background at all, you know. So when, when you got the call, you know, to, to go back a little bit, when you got the call to come in and, you know, with your tank yeah. uh, crew there, did you ever have any close calls? Well, we had a lot of, lot of um, uh, mortar fire, mm -hmm. and you know, we had a few tanks knocked out, but not knocked out in the manner that the European theater used, because the Japanese had nothing mm -hmm. equivalent to the, the German uh, 88 millimeter gun, which could penetrate a tank and go right through from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese, uh, the Japanese were very good at mortar fire. Mm -hmm. And they'd knock your tracks off, or maybe set a tank on fire. But we, we lost very few casualties in the tank mm -hmm. group. Now when you would get those calls, were you ever nervous, or were you confident that you guys could go in there and get well, the job done? You were always nervous when you are being shot at by somebody or the possibility of being tried. You know, but my, my men were all young boys. I was 21 and most of them were one or two years younger than I was. Mm -hmm. They were 18, 19, 20. And, uh, Did you feel the responsibility to kind of watch over them a little bit? Well, you, you always do that. I mean, this, this, is, this is things that people don't understand. The, the bond that you form between soldiers in combat is pretty strong. Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, the, some of these people, there's a few of them I still communicate with. And, and that was my next question. I was just yeah. going to ask if you have been able to stay in touch over the years yeah, yeah. with... Well, we, they, the, the 785th tank, man, most of the enlisted men were from Louisiana, mm -hmm. South Texas, and that part of the world. And they had a battalion reunion in New Orleans every year. These guys would get together. Uh, Mary and I went to about five or six of them, I guess. What was that experience like? Well, it was, it was interesting because uh, I was surprised that, that how old some of the young kids <laughs> <laughs> that I had had were or had gotten to me. But it was, it was interesting. We went down. A lot of the young, a lot of the young men were from Louisiana, mm -hmm. down in the Bayou, Cajuns. A lot of them were Mexican American mm -hmm. people, people, people. Do you have a favorite experience, you know, from your time in service, whether it was in training or you know, on the field during combat? Well, or maybe a, a, a memorable experience? Not, none. I think the most memorable thing that I. In, in my career, as you might say, in the service, was, was handling this prisoner of war camp. Mm -hmm. Really, I, I had no 
background, absolutely no training, and none of the enlisted people that I had in my company had no training. So to go back to that topic that you had discussed a few minutes ago, uh, you said you were there for eight months running this, you know, Japanese yeah. POW camp. What, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, what, what were some of the experiences, what were some well, of the, 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 the tasks? The Japanese prisoner war camp was basically a, a holding camp for uh, prisoners coming in from the outer island. They'd bring them in on LST and drop the ramp and they'd come off and we'd take them and process them and take their clothing and give them a fatigue and, and put them in the camp record them and do all that kind of stuff and, and it was uh, it was it was an interesting experience because some of these Japanese people were spoke good English and we could communicate with them mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a lot of odd and end here experiences now one of the things that the AFWES headquarters did with the Japanese prisoners of war was they used them as labor squads to clean up the war debris in the city and uh, so we would they'd come somebody would come down from some outfit and say well we'd like to get 20, 20 or 30 Japs to come up and clean up the place and, and so we'd send a couple guys with a rifle and 20 or 30 of these guys up and do mm -hmm. that but the major reason for this was to process the Japanese prisoners of war to go on to a more formal camp and uh, and we also had what they called the war crimes enclosure mm -hmm, as you where we touched on earlier yeah but it was it was an interesting experience uh, for me uh, if you had to sum up your overall thoughts of world war 2 and your overall experiences that that uh, you endured during your time in the war. What would it be? You know, just one lasting impression that you want people to remember your experience in, in, in the war. Of. I, I think my experience in, in the war were all, were all, I guess you might say, there's an old saying that war is, a, is long periods of boredom followed by small times of abject terror, and I guess that describes the whole thing. <laughs> you, uh, uh, you you spend a lot of time waiting around in, in the Army, as anybody who's ever been in the Army will tell you, but when you get into combat, there are periods of time that, uh, like I say, I had a, uh, times when like I said, abject terror. And if you were a kid like myself, at, at that point in time, people who are have been in the service would recognize this. Uh, you have a very strong feeling of loyalty towards your enlisted people if you get to be a lieutenant or whatever you are. And uh, I think that's one of the things that probably stick in your mind more than anything. The, uh, the times when times were tough. Mm -hmm. uh, we were on two different invasions coming on off an LSD and a tank in the middle of the night with the Navy shelling over your head on the beach. It's not a pleasant experience. And mm -hmm. I would, I've, I've often said that if, as an enlisted man, it must have been a even more for than for an officer, uh, because you you just you knew you had certain things you had to do, and and uh, particularly in armor, you had you had your gunners, and drivers, and system drivers, and people like that. Uh, but uh, but I, I I can I can probably sum it all up by saying that. I think my experience in the, in the service uh, probably prepared me for a lot of things that I did in further er, further on in life, uh, as far as being able to organize and manage people mm -hmm. and do that kind of stuff. Wow. Well, Mr. Coughlin.